Hi, my name is Rita Deering, and I am here to talk to you today about the pregnant and postpartum athlete. I'm just going to do a really brief overview and uh, just get some of the basics out there. So first of all, we know that there are some musculoskeletal and some physiological changes that occur during pregnancy, and some of these changes can certainly influence exercise tolerance and performance. Um, so for our athletes, those are really important. So a few of those things are we have an increase in respiratory rate um, at rest, increased resting oxygen consumption or their VO2, and this is due to an increase in their metabolic rate. There's also increase in resting heart rate, increase in cardiac contractility, and increase in blood volume. And so uh, this should be shifted down. Uh, resting heart rate, cardiac contractility, and blood volume, those all lead to an increase in cardiac output. And so for particularly in endurance athletes or um, athletes engaging in aerobic activity, um, that can help with delivery of oxygen and metabolic substrates to those active tissues. So that can be a wonderful thing for exercise performance. Um, other things to consider with the um, pregnant athlete is that they uh, also have a lower thirst threshold due to some of those um, hormonal changes. And so that can lead to greater fluid intake. Um, and so we also need to make sure that they are listening to that thirst cue and, and drinking more fluid so that they aren't um, dehydrating, particularly if they are engaging in physical activity and exercise. We also know that ligamentous laxity occurs during pregnancy. Um, this gets a lot of press within the pelvis. Um, however, these are systemically circulating hormones. And so we can have ligamentous laxity throughout the body. Um, the wrists are another area that are commonly impacted by um, ligamentous laxity. So some exercises may need to be modified to avoid pain, um, particularly um, any weight bearing through the upper extremity in an extended position tends to be somewhat uh, uncomfortable if ligamentous laxity is present in those joints. So you may have to modify. Um, and we don't really have um, a cookie cutter response as far as spinal alignment occurs. So um, there previously was this notion that all pregnant people had this increase in lumbar lordosis as the pregnancy progresses, but um, recent uh, literature shows us that that isn't necessarily true. Um, so the primary thing here is that you need to make sure that you're treating the person who's in front of you. So uh, make sure that you're doing a postural assessment on each individual pregnant athlete um, and basing their um, recommendations and their treatment plan off of what you see for that person instead of just assuming that they're going to end up with this increase in lumbar lordosis. So how do we determine if a pregnant individual is appropriate to participate in exercise? And this can sometimes be a bit of a daunting task um, and it might be scary both for the athlete and for clinicians advising them. So the um, Canadian Ex Society of Exercise Physiologists actually just put together this Get Active Questionnaire for Pregnancy. And this is the uh, kind of gold standard right now for determining if exercise is appropriate during pregnancy. The really nice thing about this is that it is a um, patient um, administered questionnaire. So they have all of these questions that they can answer on their own and then there's this healthcare companion um, questionnaire that goes along with it. So the pregnant athlete will fill out her questionnaire, bring it to you. You'll have this healthcare provider companion form to go along with it. And the big takeaway from this is that the majority of pregnant people are appropriate for exercise. There are very few conditions that would make them um, high risk or inappropriate to engage in moderate to vig vigorous activity. The other thing to um, watch for here or to keep in mind is that, again, the the recommendation for physical activity in pregnant individuals is the same as it is for non-pregnant individuals. They should be getting 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. And that should be spaced out over the week, minimum of three days, which is here, minimum of three days per week. However, if they can get some activity in every day, that's for the best. Um, 
anybody can benefit from exercise, even if they were previously inactive, if they have gestational diabetes, if they're overweight or obese, there can still be benefits to exercise. Um, again, a variety of different types of exercises should be utilized. So I think aerobic activity gets the most press, but strength training, um, stretching are also beneficial. Can't overlook the pelvic floor. That's a very important area. Um, so again, if if the pelvic floor isn't your area of expertise, buddy up with a, a clinician who is trained in pelvic floor and can um, provide some guidance there. And then if uh, pregnant individuals are symptomatic when lying on their back, and some of those symptoms include lightheadedness, nausea, or if they just don't feel right, um, then they should modify those activities. So instead of doing supine activities, you could have them like on a wedge or something of that nature um, just to allow um, better blood flow. Here are the contraindications um, that are shown on that companion form. And what I want to point out here is that these absolute contraindications doesn't mean bed rest. So they're, they're still doing some light physical activity. The, the activity that they need to do for their activities of daily living is still appropriate. We just don't want them engaging in moderate or vigorous physical activity. So light physical activity is still appropriate. And then again, any relative contraindications, they should have a conversation with their birth provider to make sure that they're um, safe to be engaging in moderate activity. So when after that baby is born, now we have some other things that we need to consider. Um, there are a lot of um, physiological changes that occur after childbirth as well, and then some also some musculoskeletal changes that we'll talk about too. So first of all, with labor and delivery, we have um, some potential to have disruption to core musculature. And so the pelvic floor muscles are considered part of the core. Uh, this is a computer modeling um, study that was done by Ashton Miller and Delancey uh, in 2009. But these red structures here are the pelvic floor muscles. This is the external anal sphincter. This is the vaginal opening. And this blue ball represents the fetal head. And so when the fetal head passes through the birth canal, the pelvic floor muscles stretch three times their resting length. So a 300% change in their length. Um, so it's really important, um, especially during pregnancy, that we're focusing on stretching to allow that tissue to be extensible so that we don't end up with muscle tears or avulsion fractures, things of that nature. And then with a cesarean delivery, obviously we have these surgical incisions now that have to heal, but we also have disruption to the fascia of the anterior abdominal wall and possible disruption to the skeletal muscle of the abdominal muscles, depending on um, how emergent that situation is. Um, there may be some you know, bruising or, or damage to those muscles. So when we look at the big picture here on how this impacts the musculoskeletal system, we do have evidence that postpartum individuals are weaker than um, females who have never been pregnant when we look at the trunk flexor muscles. And so that's what's represented here. And so this study was done uh, between eight and 10 weeks postpartum, and then again between 24 and 26 weeks postpartum, which is roughly six months. And so you can see in the open circles here, postpartum participants are weaker than our control participants at all of these positions. So zero is upright sitting, and then 10, 20, 30, and 40 degrees of extension, and 20 degrees of flexion. However, there is no difference between these groups in hand grip strength. So there isn't this overall total body loss of strength, um, but there does appear to be some abdominal muscle um, strength deficits. Um, we've also seen de decreased strength of the trunk rotator muscles um, in postpartum individuals who have diastasis recti abdominis compared to postpartum individuals who do not have diastasis recti abdominis. And that was at a full year postpartum. There are also differences in fatigue. So postpartum females are more fatigable or they have lower muscular endurance of the trunk muscles than um, females who have never been pregnant. And in this early postpartum period, eight to 10 weeks postpartum, um, individuals who had a cesarean delivery were more fatigable or had lower muscular endurance than individuals who had a vaginal delivery. But at six weeks postpartum, we no longer saw that difference in delivery type 
but we did still see a pretty significant um, difference in their fatigability in that the postpartum females are still uh, more fatigable. There are also some um, differences in neural activation. So steadiness of muscle contraction um, gives us an idea of a neural drive to those muscles. And our postpartum females in this study had greater fluctuations in force of their trunk, trunk flexor muscles than um, females who had never been pregnant, which suggests that there's potentially some differences in um, motor drive to those muscles. So when we look at returning to exercise and particularly returning to sport, the International Olympic Committee released a five part series of systematic reviews between 2016 and 2018. And their overall recommendations for return to training or return to sport are that it needs to be individualized. Um, and you need to take into account their medical status as well as any physical healing. So if they had a surgery, um, if they had any perineal tearing, things of that nature, we need to make sure that those tissues are healing appropriately. Um, it, the systematic reviews did cite several instances of females returning to exercise routines within just a few weeks of, dis of delivery, so prior to six weeks postpartum, um, and, and able to do so successfully and without um, any musculoskeletal or pelvic health um, adverse effects. They also recommend looking at this return to sport as a continuum with three elements. And this is consistent with other return to sport literature following athletic injuries. And the first um, continuum, first part of the continuum is just participation. So this is rehabilitation and training. So it's, it's a much lower level than what they were accustomed to when they were competing probably prior to pregnancy, but it's still engaging in some degree of exercise. Next is returning to sport. So now we're introducing sport specific movements and activities, and they may even be competing at this level, but at a lower level than their pre-pregnancy um, status. And then the final is performance. So now they're back to where they were prior to um, pregnancy or sometimes even above where they were before pregnancy. And so this is a viewpoint um, that I co-authored with Dr. Shafali Christopher and Dr. Brian Heiderscheidt that was published in JOSPT, where we kind of expand on that then. And again, instead of looking at these arbitrary time points of saying, no, you shouldn't go back before 12 weeks or you shouldn't go back before this time period, really what we need to be looking at is the musculoskeletal demands of that athlete's sport and that specific athlete's pregnancy and postpartum journey. So somebody who has um, pretty low musculoskeletal demands and had just a breeze of a pregnancy, a birth experience and postpartum recovery, well, they're gonna get back to competition probably a lot faster than somebody who does a really high impact sport, you know, say a marathon runner who had um, a really traumatic birth, maybe an emergency C-section and then a postpartum surgery for retained placenta or something of that nature. It's gonna take that individual a lot longer um, to get back to that competitive um, portion of this recovery phase. So it really needs to be individualized. The other thing that we highlighted here in this three-phase approach is that really it should be a multidisciplinary um, care team. So there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot of things happening in the postpartum period. You know, you have wound healing, you have physiological changes. If they choose to breastfeed, you have lactation. Um, there can be psychological issues. Um, you have to know what kind of support they have at home. So really involving mental health specialists, dietitians as needed, lactation consultants, um, as well as the traditional physician and physical therapist um, would really be beneficial. And then this is just another study to show that uh, returning to exercise prior to six weeks postpartum um, did not have uh, any adverse effects on the pelvic floor. So um, this study was published in 2020 and looked at two groups of postpartum individuals. The first group returned to exercise prior to six weeks postpartum, and the second group returned to exercise after six weeks postpartum. And so what they found at one year postpartum was that there was no difference between those groups in vaginal resting pressure, in their pelvic floor muscle strength, 
or their pelvic floor muscle endurance. There is also no difference between the groups in symptoms of stress urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse. So again, shows that you can go back to exercise prior to six weeks postpartum and, and not have deficits. Um, again, that's not necessarily true for everybody, but it's, um, it's just more evidence that we don't have to put these hard and fast timelines on it um, that are blanket for everybody. So in summary, exercise is safe for pregnant and postpartum females. Uh, many athletes can successfully return to high level um, athletics um, and that some do successfully return prior to six weeks postpartum to exercise. And then again, the return to sport or to exercise in general should be individualized. It should be a gradual progression of activity we need to utilize a multi-systems approach so that we are honoring those physiological changes, those psychosocial changes, um, as well as musculoskeletal, um, including pelvic health issues. Um, and then also that a multidisciplinary team is ideal.